time to buy us, Carlisle. This is the Acquirers Podcast. My special guest today is Matt Joss from Maven Funds, uh, formerly of The Motley Fool. Matt's got an absolutely fascinating take on high-growth companies, how to identify those that can make a leap across the chasm, how to find those that can't, where you want to buy them in the S-curve, coming up right after this. Tobias Carlisle is the founder and principal of Acquirers Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the acquirers' funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of acquirers' funds or affiliates. For more information, visit acquiresfunds.com. One of the problems that you have when you're valuing very high growth businesses is getting comfortable with the valuation because a lot of it depends on what the next few years to the terminal value are going to do. So, how do you? go through that process how do you get comfortable with that yeah i think it's uh, we think a lot about the limiting factor of the business and i think that the one of the big areas we disagree i think the whole framework of how we think about investing is slightly wrong because we think about um, return on capital as being the primary um, limiting factor and endpoint which is definitely how the world was but i don't think it is anymore and so i guess capital is now so abundant um, that I don't think it's a limiting factor in a business. And you could kind of think about it like there's a lot of different inputs to a business, right? And we've just chosen capital as being the one that we we typically measure generally investors. Um, but you could say something else, right? You could think like return on land and, you know, like every year they get some profits, they reinvest in more land, but you don't think that because it'd be ridiculous because businesses, that's not the constraining factor. And I think it's the same for a lot of the technology businesses we look at. The constraining factor isn't the capital because they're so capital light and it's like, if you actually calculate the return on incremental capital for you know a high growth technology, it's just so large, it's like abstract. It's not really yeah. a factor. Um, and so I think often for it, it's more the adoption curve. So we think a lot about like S curves of growth, um, which is like the derivative of the adoption curve. If you look at how things how things go, um, and so we're trying to find when they're kind of inflicting up the start of that adoption curve. And that's how I think about modeling it, basically. It's trying to think of, you know, at what rate will adoption happen? Is there things I can do to tip adoption forward? And so that's another, that's probably the best inflection point if I can find it as that hyper growth where they're just getting up that face of the S curve. <clears throat> and I think that's also why it's undervalued. So, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> um, I think people tend to linearly project forward. I don't think we think exponentially. We just can't, basically. Our brains don't work that way. So everything I do, like that's why I say I'm a value investor still, is I'm still thinking of you know pockets of mispricing. And I think basically at the start of the S-curve, people project linearly forward, but the S-curve is going to start going like this, right? And so then it starts, people have to constantly re-rate and realize what the business is going to do. At a certain point, at the top of that S-curve, people are projecting forward too much, and the S-curve starts flattening out, and that's when you want to start getting off. And that's why I think valuation still matters because i think if you're in never sell land then you just get caught in that if there's not another s curve to catch you i guess um you get caught there so we're thinking about that as kind of the, the limiting factor i guess of the business that's more that more so than capital that's an interesting comment because i have i did notice that when i, I worked in a in a reasonably high growth uh te telecom company for a long time mm -hmm and uh, never never earned more than like 13% on equity, but grew six times over you know, 10 years because they were raising capital and reinvesting at a very high rate. So I guess the, qu the natural question from that is, how do you know where you are on the S-curve? Yeah, good question. I think, it's, <clears throat> I think it's just having a good idea of the market size itself, um, talking to people in the market and getting an idea of who's adopting really. So having, if you have a really good idea of the market size and who the other competitors are, you can kind of see how much they've signed up of that business. Um, so if they're starting to get into the, you know, the, 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 mainstream you know and then late majority that's where you start tipping past that point um so that's that's probably the main thing is having a really good idea of what stage of you know the life cycle just by knowing market share basically for all the participants and um not really market share i guess because they're creating the market as they go it's more like you know total adoption share um and you do start to see it like you know, I think this ties in, I think this all just fits basically Peter Lynch talked about sell when they're not growing earnings anymore. So you do start to see it come through in the fundamentals. And I think that can be a trap for a lot of value, quality value guys, because they like see a really great company that has a bad quarter. And that's kind of where you want to, often people want to pounce, but I think it can be the worst time if it's because they're starting to flatten out. Um, and so they're just 
you know, spinning their wheels now because they're not getting those early adopters. Um, there's a real book that influenced me, Crossing the Chasm. And that's another one where a lot of companies just get stuck even earlier than that, where they don't, they kind of talk, it's not actually a smooth curve. There's like this chasm between the two, between the early adopters and the early majority. And that's probably the hardest part. I think you see some early traction, but maybe they just stall out there. They never really make that jump from being something that's good enough for, you know, really passionate techno or whatever people to the to everybody else just too hard to use to get across from that first group who are prepared to wear the, the arrows yeah i think that's a too hard to use and maybe the technology is just not there or maybe they haven't really solved the problem well enough because you know the first people uh willing to close their eyes and you know you know endure a lot of pain i guess to use your product and i think a lot of people if they get too cocky with that stage, I guess they're not constantly thinking bigger and improving and what they can do. Then it just often, we just see it stall out. Maybe it's bad management as well. That's why you need to think other management team really there to be a global company. Cause it's, it's hard, man. Like I'm, I'm not managing a global company. The more I learn about <laughs> and culture and everything else, the more I'd like have an appreciation for these guys, how hard it is to grow a business to be like, you know, 500 or a thousand people. Like it's just phenomenally difficult. And so I think that, you know, I think um, Andreessen, had a, I think it was, or maybe Paul Graham had a line that most startups self-destruct, they don't get destroyed by a competitor. And I think that's the biggest thing by far is just looking for avoiding those signs of self-destruction. Um, did you, did you start with the Motley Fool in Australia? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. So I was writing for them when I was living in Copenhagen and then, then moved down to Australia. You were writing for but, Motley Fool Australia from Copenhagen. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. How did that happen? Um, yeah, I guess I'm originally from New Zealand. So I was in Copenhagen. I had like a grad role out of uni and wanted to see the world and whatever else. And so living in Copenhagen and around then I get like bitten by the investing bug, I guess you'd say. Um, uh, when I arrived there, I think, you know, my girlfriend then became my wife, wasn't there for about six months. So Danish winter, <laughs> all I was doing basically, you know, sunsets at 3 p.m. All I was doing was investing, um, started like investment club, just looking for other ways to get engaged basically while I was, while I was working at the same time. And yeah, just started writing for Motley Fool Australia. Working I guess in finance? I followed them. Yeah, working in finance, but not that kind of finance. It's for a big shipping company. So it was like, right. you know, managing the P&L for all trade to Africa or something, which was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, definitely not like, not stock market investing, I guess. So what made you a value guy or, or do you not characterize yourself as a value guy? No. So, I mean, I guess I started investing when I was about 18 and was just lost. Like I had no philosophy, but just really interested in it. And then like mid twenties discovered Buffett, <laughs> which is kind yeah. of weird. Like it's so well, I don't know if he was that well known in New Zealand at the time, but I didn't know much about him. I guess I didn't know anyone who was an investor um, and then discovered him. And it was just like a light bulb went off, you know, like all the classic things of feeling like he suddenly knew what was going on. Um, so yeah, that, and then that's when it started really taking over my life. Cause before then I was just kind of like lost. <laughs> who was it? Who was it found? The big Kiwi investors, we can't mention Briley anymore now that he's got in trouble, but who, oh who God, else is? Yeah, that was crazy. <laughs> who um, else is yeah, uh, I guess, there? Yeah, there wasn't that much when I was growing up that was like a big influence, I guess. Like there wasn't, yeah, just uh, it was always more looking globally and even now, I guess, looking to the US a lot more. There's um, a couple of blokes who are like uh, big LBO type guys. There was a guy who's a truck driver who t t turned it uh, into- Graham Hart. Graham Hart, that's right. Is he the one who yeah, punched man. out yeah. Russell Crowe in, in an English uh, No, that's a, that's uh, a different guy. Um, he, that's, like, I'm blanking on his name, but he's he's had his own brushes with the law, actually. Has he really? He's been, yeah. Um, but no, Graham Hart, yeah, he started as a panel beater. He's he's like he's a, a hero of every self-made man. Now he's like one of the richest man in New Zealand. Um, yeah, he actually, yeah, he, yeah. Yeah, anyway, bit of a hero, I guess. He's a pretty good yeah. operator. I saw him, I remember, this is a long time ago before I was, I think, don't think I was even working at the time, but he he helped save that Aussie spice company. Mm -hmm. It was going under and he came in and kind of bailed them out and ran it. I've not, not really seen him mentioned much since then, just in the States and in Australia, but... Yeah, he's big in packaging, which is like, I guess, not the sexiest industry. And most yeah, of the time he gets smart. mentioned in the media as someone like attacking him for being rich for not much else. But, right. um, yeah, yeah, he just gets into like boring industries and just, yeah, just, you know, streams can't, efficiencies out of them. Can't, can't hate that. It's, that's very yeah. value-like. 
<laughs> yeah, pretty much. So um, what was your, when you were at the Motley Fool, what was your sort of remit or what was your focus? Yeah, I guess, um, so I was like a value guy. Part of why I wanted to join was learn more of like David Gardner style investing. Like, I guess I see myself now as like a mix between the two, which is obviously pretty contrasting. Um, but yeah. yeah, so I joined uh, as a research analyst for a portfolio there, which is like a small cap growth portfolio, which is basically kind of what I'm doing now, I guess. And then became portfolio manager there. Companies like fast growing businesses and trying to figure out which ones had the potential to, you know, be the next big winners and whatever else. Um, yeah, so that was it. So it was pretty cool, like getting to do that, starting out the gate, not having to do like one pick a month kind of typical newsletter stuff. It was much more like a, a portfolio that we're managing. So, yeah. And so now you've got your own firm, um, Maven. And what's the focus at Maven? Yeah, it's pretty similar, I guess. It's just Australia and New Zealand, and I was debating that when I decided to start it, but um, I just wanted to, I'm really big on like mastering a particular area, and I, I, I just get well, information anxiety. I think Josh Wolf talks about if there's something that you don't know, so I just like to like really know that domain. And the idea is just trying to find, you know, small and micro cap companies like Ian Castle is a big influence for me. Um, while they that have the potential to go on to be those, you know, big dominant businesses and trying to find them as small as possible and recognizing, you know, you need to cut bait with a lot of them along the way. But um, yeah, that's the focus basically is just trying to find them as small as they are and then hold the whole way. So when you're, I mean, we, oh, there's two things that I want to ask you. So how much of it is a sort of David Gardner type philosophy? And that's, does David, does he do that? Does he cut bait or does he sort of hold them hell or high water? No, he doesn't. Yeah. Um, I got to meet David a couple of times. He's a really fascinating guy. He's like one of the happiest guys you've ever met. I think he's just designed his life. Like he manages, I don't think he has any direct reports at Motley Fool. Smart. <laughs> despite, despite being like the biggest owner in the company. And he just, um, yeah, he just does what he wants basically. And I think his, I've thought a lot about like how he got to deliver the returns he did because he doesn't do any valuation. I, I mean, he, I mean, he might say there's some, compare some relative stuff, but it's really small. Um, and I think he just played like a huge amount of games. Like he just, he's like a board game obsessed dude. And um, I remember him saying once that the best strategy is often like the non-dominant strategy. So I think a part of his view is just trying to find it. Like he just picks up little inefficiencies um, that other people by doing the opposite of what other people are doing often. A um, non-dominant strategy. What's, what's Yeah. That so I guess like if you're playing a board game, and everyone, like he, he plays set like a, of Catan. I don't play that game, but he says like, if everyone's going for one thing and they're all battling for that, you want to be doing kind of the opposite of that because it's going to be, you know, not much competition. So if everyone's trying to value the next quarter's earnings, I guess he's thinking very long-term. If everyone's trying to, you know, jump in and out, he's trying to do the opposite. So some of that, some of that kind of stuff, um, yeah, is how he's like willing to do things that seem really crazy and put his, you know, his, his list of um, things that he looks for, like past price appreciation and, whatever else it just seems like this really eclectic mix um so i guess i've tried to pull out like the parts that i really resonate with like what leads to i think high quality you know long-term returns but then marry that with valuation and so that's where like i wouldn't i definitely am not like a never sell camp pretty against that side um and just trying to really do like a, a dcf and trying to forecast out those cash flows and that gives me the confidence to hold so um, a lot of his approach has really been willing to hold during all the ups and downs because there's like massive drawdowns and any of those runs that he's had in Amazon and whatever else. And for me, at least it comes from the valuation side. Um, and so, yeah, the cutting bait is just being willing to sell quickly. If you realize that it's not working out, um, if that thesis is wrong, I should say. Um, and yeah, so that's again, just kind of marrying like the valuation approach with what he's trying to do. So what's an ideal position? You're sort of hunting initially in small and micro, looking for high growth, but not at, you, there's, you're conducting some sort of DCF valuation. So mm. you're assuming quite a lot of growth, but you're still trying to buy at a discount to that. Yeah, that's right. I guess um, I I've just always love finding like something that's completely missed and underfollowed. I like being one of the first guys in, ideally. Um, if not the first to look at it, then the first to like at least look at it in a particular way, I guess. So it's more like analytical difference. Uh, and yeah, just trying to find them as early as you can. It doesn't, it doesn't mean immediately. Um, so it's more like when they have enough traction to have some view of what that's going to be. Because I am always forecasting cash flows. I'm never doing relative valuation or anything like that. So it's really at a point where I think I can forecast 
you know, a base case for them. And typically if they outperform that, it's often because they have like multiple ways to win an optionality and they layer that on top later, but it's really, you know, getting really comfortable with the management team, making sure that it's, um, you know, very ethical group. Cause that's pretty rare. Um, but I guess it's also a nature of the market. I mean, like the micro cap generally, I think is much more like listed venture capital and Australia is, as you probably know, is like pretty wild market. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just filtering out, a lot of the worst and then just like narrowing in there and then yeah finding stuff to hold all the way through you just ideally. filter out the junior minus and you wouldn't have all <laughs> left to do after that would you yes i did i try to go through every company a to z like buffett buffett's old thing um a couple times a year last last time i did it last year i think there's 2200 listed companies 40 percent were explorers and yeah. um, so like that those are pretty quick <laughs> i yeah. don't touch those at all um then you got a good chunk of biotech and then you've got like quite a few like industrials and some kind of like middling companies, like a lot that should kind of hang along. But it basically there's a huge number that are outside any inde- any real index. Like people only talk about the top 500. So there's at least what, 1,700 other companies. And even then most people focus on like the top 200 companies. So it's basically 2,000 companies that don't have as much or very little institutional following. And it's, yeah, I guess the area you're trying to play in. It's one of the funny things about the Australian market that I ha- have I wasn't aware of it when I was in it, but when I came out of it, I became a little bit more aware of it that the market cap falls off dramatically, even in mm-hmm. that top 200. The last one in the top 200, I can't remember the last time I looked, it might've been 50 million market cap. Is that too small? No, that sounds about right. I mean, it varies. It depends on how much of a fallen where, angel where we are before market, gets yeah. kicked out of the index, to be honest. Um, yeah, but it is it is wild. Like I look, there's a lot of companies with like 4 million market cap um, and they're, they're probably too small in terms of distraction um, for what I'm, what I'm looking for. So I guess I'm, yeah, I'm just looking for something that actually has real traction basically like has has something that's working i guess you'd call it product market fit but a business that's actually executing um and that's how i build my models is basically on what they're doing today and i think um i don't know it's getting some of it's getting a bit crazy like some part we're catching some of maybe the robin hood bug <laughs> from the us yeah. but i think I it's saw still... gme the aussie gme yeah. whatever that is <laughs> took a run yeah exactly like a, a mining explorer again is um, that what it was I it was <laughs> um so yeah it is but generally i think for a long time particularly technology had been really disregarded in australia like i, I think because of the dot-com crash like a lot of people got burned maybe more so even in the us i don't know but it's just a whole generation that didn't even look at it um, and it was a small part of the market as well so you could ignore it and it started to change more recently i think with afterpay maybe what was the what was the big yeah Aussie? zero was a well zero. that zero is a new zero I'm, I'm from new zealand so i'm, I'm definitely not letting Aussie claim that completely but that was um definitely but one of the big ones in the asx they have like their own acronym which is like wax i think it's wise tech um ultium appen and zero um which i don't it's a weird acronym for me to that's all right i don't mind but, but yeah those are some of the ones that started paved the way uh unfortunately atlassian obviously listed overseas that would have been a good one to have in australia but those kind of paved the way and then there's a whole lot more that you know under that umbrella um australia the asx is trying to be like the world's like easy earliest place for a tech business to list um, yeah. which has its pros and cons so you get a lot of like even israeli companies listing on the asx yeah. which i think probably pretty fishy like overall track record of that like the outcomes from that but yeah i've seen some um i think that there's a few good things about australia one of them is that there's only one board so you don't have like you know if you list in toronto there's the uh uh the venture exchange if you're in london there's the aim in australia straight on the main board which i think looks Mm -hmm. good if you're a small company and then the the listing rules are a bit i mean i don't know exactly where they are now but they're always a little bit lower you could get on with um, pretty minimal capital raising, pretty minimal mm-hmm. market cap, mm-hmm. which is probably why there's a lot of there's a lot of gamble in that lower end of the market. Yeah, I think so. I think Aussies, as you well know, are like a, a nation of gamblers. Like I think the yeah. per capita gambling losses is something like twelve hundred dollars per person, like losses some, somewhere around there. Um, and it's I think that bleeds over as well because. You've got that culture. People love to have a punt. And then you have people who make a lot of money on these speculative mining companies, yeah. right? And then that just bleeds over to like, yeah, let's get into this thing. Um, so you see these huge cycles where things just run crazy and then crash down. And I typically like to find them when they're coming back up 
you know, it's kind of like the hype cycle, like Gartner's yeah. hype cycle. Yeah. They crash down, then they start building the real business. Hopefully they raise some capital at the top <laughs> yeah. um, and then they can start, you know, feeding that through. Um, yeah. So but that's also put- why you need to, we need to trim and watch valuation, I think, because things can get crazy sometimes. So how are you putting together a portfolio? What's, what's a, how many positions do you like to hold? How diversified across sectors? Or do you not consider that at all? Like what's a good initial position size? What's a trimming size? Yeah, I think a lot about the portfolio management side. I guess that was kind of the value add of what we were doing at Motley Fool and the service that I ran is kind of differentiating from just ideas to portfolio management. Um, and I think, I think it's just underrated. I always think like, if I could ask Buffett one thing is like, how do you decide that? Because, you know, a 5% position has literally like a 5x impact on your portfolio compared to 1%. Um, for me, anyway, it's it's kind of 15 to 30 companies. It's kind of a sweet spot where I think you're getting enough diversification. You're not getting, you know, punched in the nose too often, um, but also concentrating to your best ideas. Um, and yeah, w- within that, probably leaning um, more towards maybe the top five or something, having a slightly higher weight. Um, I think at cost, we, you know, 15% would be a very large position if we were initiating. Wouldn't ever really initiate there. It'd have to be, I oh, don't say never, but, you know, if, if, if Berkshire Hathaway is trading for a dollar or whatever, you always think right. of something. Right, perfection um, at that, kind of, that's, at that yeah, size. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and then I think trimming it as it got larger than that. But, you know, initiating probably the smallest I go is maybe like a 2% position I'd, around that, that kind of level because it's you want it to be meaningful enough that you're, you know, thinking about it and it's actually generating some returns for you. Um, and then in terms of like sectors, one, one area I disagree with a lot of people was thinking of technology as a sector um, right. because i think it is regarding like price movements but i'm not thinking about price i'm thinking about fundamental diversification and in that regard you know zero is accounting software that spans all this thing another one's printed circuit board software whatever else right so it's really thinking about the fundamental drivers i guess um i'm okay with prices moving against us i'm not okay with like all the fundamentals <laughs> moving against us um so that's how i think about balancing the two out um, to the degree that you can. I think Terry Smith said something similar to that recently where he said it's silly to include Facebook, Google, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, like they're mm-hmm. disti- very distinct businesses, but they're all folded under the one. I may be wrong about that, but they're all, they're yeah, all no, full I, of I technology agree. companies. I, yeah, I completely agree. I think you just think about it from first principles. It was always kind of weird. And I think it was partly because of the way the industry is driven by, you know, sell side mandates and whatever else um i guess it made sense for a lot of other industries so it just happened that technology all gets lumped into one sector even though it spans you know every industry now yeah. what are the differences between australia and new zealand in terms of the market um so i do i can invest in new zealand as well I, unfortunately new zealand's exchange is just kind of dying basically i feel like a lot's going to going to australia and i feel like they run it too much like a monopoly would be my my hot take on it because they seem to um seem to extract like high prices i think interactive brokers you can't even trade new zealand because the nzx exchange wants too much money from them um so i think unfortunately that's not going too well but it does mean the companies that are there are very high quality like a lot of monopoly type businesses or duopoly businesses they gently pay a lot in dividends so the actual returns that yeah, so I think the returns are around 15% a year for the New Zealand market. So it's actually returned pretty pretty good returns. Um, but they tend to be dominant businesses with not much reinvestment potential because it's just the New Zealand market. And saying that though, there was like uh, when Zero really blew up in like 2014, the first time it, it had that big hype, um, quite a few other companies listed under its umbrella. So there's a few there still, I think, that are just starting to come through now that we still find interesting. Um, but yeah, I think generally a lot are going direct to Australia now. I saw, uh, I remember looking one time, New Zealand Telecom has a, a secondary listing. Well, I don't know which one is the secondary listing, but it's listed on the NYC as well, or it was for a long mm-hmm. time. Does it still do that? Yeah, it's, um, I'm not sure with Telecom, but it is pretty common. Like Zero even was a lot will dual list on Australia as well. So the kind of biggest companies you can pick off on the ASX. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I was always just, New Z- Zero actually delisted from the New Zealand exchange. So it was pretty much breaking the hopes. <laughs> For a lot of Kiwis, I think, which definitely helped the share price. You know, they concentrated all that float into the ASX and suddenly they, you know, had a big run up and could get picked up by all the funds and indices and stuff. Um, but yeah, so unfortunately not the best for New Zealand. 
So how, how are you hunting for ideas then? Do you screen or do you read the AFR or how do you, what's the process? Yeah, I try and, um, I guess my like overall philosophy is I'm looking for like power law winners, basically. So these trying to cast like thinking like a VC, basically like trying to cast a wide net. I'm not doing that with my portfolio, but just trying to do that with my scanning and, and checking. So I try to read um, basically every announcement for companies in my universe, which is quite a large number of companies. And then just identify, you know, that's probably one of the way, main ways is like using myself as a screen. I'm trying to like train the pattern recognition. You see, it also helps you appreciate when you see a good business because you see so many bad businesses and businesses with like zero cash flow, <laughs> like incoming cash flow. Um, and so, yeah, I'm trying to do that. I try and uh, do that, go through all of the companies one by one, you know, once a year or hopefully twice a year. And then just reading AFR and following curiosity, like you start talking to one, they mention another name, you start digging into that, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, kind of a weird acclaim. And then networking as well, like talking to other investors in the market, what are you seeing? And yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, my old boss used to do the same thing, I, I, which I think that Americans might be surprised to hear that you can even do that. But he used to sit there with basically, he knew that he'd just follow all of the announcements all day long mm -hmm. and wait for yeah. one that he sort of, he'd recognize capital return or something like that that he was looking for. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, at one point I built like a, a scraper so that it could like filter out some of the junk for me, but ASX keeps changing its website. So <laughs> maybe they don't like you doing that. Yeah, I've done but, the same. Um, thank, <laughs> yeah, <okay>. Bastards. <laughs> Um, but thankfully, their new website lets you can filter by industry, which is one of the main things I'm trying to chuck out, like the mining explorers and just look at all the others. Um, and yeah, I think that's a good way to just keep abreast, at least, um, because it's such a so many small companies that it helps you like catch if someone's, I think about it like a fundamental inflection point. Um, I guess that's probably when I started like making the migration from value into this kind of hybrid is trying to find not where the share price is going to rally. So not like a typical catalyst, but where the fundamentals are going to improve a lot and trying to identify those spots is like an opportunity to get involved with the business. So I saw you had a post on your site about that. Can you just talk about that a little bit? How do you go about doing that identification? Yeah, I guess it's um, first just having a really good grounding of what the business is doing and how its model works. And you can kind of identify different times, but there's a whole lot of different, it's kind of like hidden hidden growth often as part of it. Um, so maybe they've got a, like a really fast growing product or segment that's been hidden by another that's slower. Maybe it's a new distribution agreement. And as long as it's not like a very pumpy management team that's overselling that and people overreacting, often that doesn't get appreciated. And if you can talk to management and really understand this is like a real agreement where they're putting like thousands of salespeople behind it, that's a huge fundamental change. And, and then you know valid, validating that as well, talking to people in the industry. Um, but yeah, there's a whole lot basically like launching a new product or some area that's tipping into higher growth, often operating leverage, frankly, um, is, is just when it's starting to tip. Often once it's tipping into cash flow positive, people don't appreciate operating leverage when you're going from losing 5 million to losing 1 million. But when you go from losing 1 to 3 million positive, suddenly everyone's like, wow. And then the next year that happens, you know, so it's just like understanding the business model and the unit economy. The uh, before you said it, I was going to mention that Ian Castle. I think it was Ian. I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to label him if it's not. But I think he said um, something similar that he likes to. Well, often you can find these companies that the best time to buy them is two or three or one or two or three quarters before they flip into cash flow or earnings positive because they look like a loser until that point, and then all of a sudden they pop up on all these screens because they're they're making money and that's a good kind of inflection point for the businesses because that operating leverage is so massive at that point. Yeah, it's a funny one. I think particularly here, maybe people have always been much more focused on profitable businesses. So it's like suddenly it just enters the universe. Um, and I think there's just, I don't know, there's a lot, maybe it's changing a bit more now, but people are off, there's a heap of dividends here as well. So it's like your tax advantage to paying a dividend. So, you know, you have this hyper growth tech company being asked, when are you going to pay a dividend? It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, why would you want to pay a dividend? Um, but yeah, so I think that tipping in a profit is suddenly like, now it's a real company in a lot of people's eyes. Um, so yeah, I think that just gets a rewrite typically. So that's how you, yeah, that's how you scan for these companies, but how are you then filtering down into the things that, you know, what's the filter validation process like? 
Yeah. So I guess uh, we go, we try to go really deep basically because a lot of people haven't done this research before. There's not like a initiation report often to read, or if there is, oh, frankly, it's not very good sometimes. <laughs> um, so we just try and talk to everyone we can, like talk to suppliers, customers, competitors. Um, and we have like a, it used to be called a one page. It's grown to about a five or 10 pager, I guess. But um, what we're wanting to do with that though, is really try and like exclude the business as fast as possible. So we're trying to break the thesis rather than include it because we want to be able to move on. So we're trying to like, you know, turn over, you know, Peter Lynch's, um, the person who turns over the most rocks wins the games kind of I've got that one stuck on my wall <laughs> um, yeah. it's definitely like I think a big part of what what we're looking for so yeah just trying to trying to rule them out like if they don't have what we're looking for which typically is some kind of competitive advantage either a demand or a supply side competitive advantage hopefully both of those to combine um, and then um, basically looking for scalability and and runway so I don't like t um, total addressable market because I think people abuse that massively um, it's more about you know, the size and strength of that niche that often it is a niche that they're in. It's not like they're, they're not going to be the next Facebook, but they could be the next, you know, whatever supplier to a, a small niche part of an industry. And that can be really valuable. Um, and I, yeah, I guess the big framework for what we're thinking is a lot of Michael Malbison stuff, but particularly his measuring the moat. That was probably another big turning point and evolution for me as I kind of try and merge value and, and growth um, is thinking about those few businesses in the industry, like, uh, he did that beautiful map and the original measuring the moat paper, which I can't find anymore. But um, where like, I think the airline industry, like most of the industry just destroys value uh, for shareholders, creates value for customers, but destroys value for shareholders. And very few capture all of the profit of the industry. It's like, funnily enough, like catering businesses and software booking reservation system businesses and a couple of other engineering services. So yeah, that's what we're trying to find basically is those little niches within an industry. Um, and yeah, just a whole lot of work trying to identify those and, and rule them out. Any any dodginess is an early one, so we can we rule that out pretty quickly. Um, yeah. How, how often are you finding new ideas? Because it's a, Australia's not even including New Zealand, not a huge market. You mm. must be fairly aware every time something new comes to market. So it must be there's a lot of guys hunting for similar kind of stuff. I would have thought. Yeah, I guess it's, you're just limited also by size. Like as um, funds get more successful, they tend to grow up and they, they can't really fish in the same pond. So, um, you know, they get to 500 million of funds under management. It's pretty hard for them to invest in, you know, a sub $100 million company. Um, and we are willing to like, you know, hold companies as they grow bigger as well. So I don't, you know, I could, this could happen to a $500 million company or something like that. But um, yes, yeah, so that's one. And then, I, I think it, it kind of depends. There are definitely like smart um, individual investors out there, but um, the kind of relative capital, it's less likely that they're finding some of the stuff, I guess. Um, and then just doing like a huge amount of work on it. There's, there's so many companies that it does, although it's a small market, you know, just having over a thousand of these things, it's enough for people to get lost and focused on the same few names. Um, but yeah, you're right. I guess our way of thinking about it is we, like the yardstick, although we're obviously over, you know, longer periods um, aiming to beat the market. I also just, another internal measure is just of these, you know, what I'd consider like a fundamental multi-bagger, like a fund, something that's, you know, fundamentally growing cash flows manifold. How many of those do we catch basically? And, you know, stripping out mining, stripping out biotech stuff that we never would have done, but like over the, over the few years that we operate, do we, you know, what ratio of those are we catching? And hopefully it's a very high ratio is our goal. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's not a huge number of new ones, you know, every year. So the, the portfolio turnover is very low and it's really about finding something good enough to displace whatever else you own. What, what do you miss? What, what, have what historically, I, what sort of stuff have you missed? Um, I think it's just areas like circles of competence. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more stuff happening now with FinTech and, and lending. Um, you know, you mentioned, and after pay, there's probably like 10 different after pay probably an area that I've yeah. you know, expanded more into. Um, so it's probably, yeah, that, that kind of just being aware of new business models and upskilling into them a bit. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff has probably been some of the, the bigger ones. Yeah. After pay was an interesting one because it, it seems like such an obvious idea that some, I can't believe that nobody had done layaway online yeah so. yeah it's 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 um it's really fascinating um because there was you know some big competitors in the u.s but just that model of doing four payments i think is bizarrely simple but that was a big part of the driver because it just 
um, I think it, I think it's like a behavioral hack. People buy that and they don't think they paid 120 bucks. They think they paid 30 bucks. And so they buy more and it sounds dumb, but I tried it. And even my brain was like thinking that way. Like it's tricked just, into it. <laughs> yeah, just tricked. And I think, um, I think that's a big, I think that's actually some of the stuff we look for is, um, what was that? alchemy the, the rory sutherland he talked about like um behavioral moonshots something that isn't like a 10x improvement product wise but a 10x improvement in customer experience and i think that's where you can actually find a lot of like analytical edges really thinking through the yeah the customer drivers and it might seem like oh there's no edge to that business there's nothing that different about it but if they're if it's driving consumer behavior and just a that kind of different way where people love it and whatever else, then you can find a real edge in those businesses. So yeah, it's something I think about a lot more now, not just looking for the hard product stuff. How, how, how does the, I guess, behavioral drivers and the marketing, you know, fit together with that. Did you pick up Afterpay? Um, not, not as a, yeah, a little, a little personally, but um, in, in between, I guess the two, but no, it's been, it's been a tricky one to be honest. So Cause no, it was not, too expensive. Probably one of the few. It just rocked. Yeah, it, it was, right. I actually looked at it super early and the unit economics at the time were quite bad. Um, right. so, so they were losing money on every train. Transaction, and I figured, um, but what I missed was that they were what they charge merchants quite significantly. So they were losing money then, but they increased their take rate dramatically, and that was able to get them across the line. Um, so yeah, out of wax, I think we got WiseTech, um, App, and Ultium, and Zero, but we missed Afterpay, and Afterpay was probably the biggest home run out of all. Maybe, maybe competing with Zero, I guess. For yeah. folks who aren't familiar with the Australian market, which is probably a lot of people who listen, which is probably like ninety-two percent of the people who listen to the podcast, what are they, what are those other companies, and what do they do? Um, yeah, so they're all software that's like the, you know, local version of the tech index, but they're pretty different. Um, so Appin is a company that provides data sets for AI. Um, so they basically have a huge remote workforce. It's like tagging data sets for, you know, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, et cetera. Um, and they're just had exploding demand basically, and, um, kind of a, a bit of a, um, scale advantage around what they were doing because you know they have 800,000 people and could turn around projects better than, than anyone else. Um, Ultium pr printed circuit board design software. So you think of all the you know smart devices around. They um, does help made the software that helped you design those, those circuit boards and those devices. So again, really niche, but a really big global industry. Um, Zero accounting software. That was one came out in New Zealand, listed at a dollar. Like. The, wouldn't have been buying it when it listed because it was like pre-revenue and just an idea. Um, it's now about 130 bucks, I think. Um, and that one, uh, you know, small business accounting software. So they found a way to sell through accountants to small businesses and bring it onto the cloud when it was all, you know, um, locally hosted, I guess, before then. So yeah, and then WiseTech again, uh, another software company, this time in like global logistics management software, um, basically. So, you know, freight forwarders and, and trucking companies and whatever else use their software. So yeah, that's, um, I guess, being like a fertile ground. The, the tricky part with tech, a lot of those, some of those are getting like bit up very expensive now. So we don't own, um, definitely don't own all of those today. And it's really just trying to find um, that next generation that are uh, still really underappreciated, whether it's in tech or something else. I think I'm thinking a lot more about what are the scalable businesses that can have those niches without just having a tech name on it, or maybe they're enabled by technology, but not don't get classified as a, a tech business or um, whatever else. Cause I think there's a whole heap that just get past still under the radar and don't get appreciated. And that's what we're trying to find, I guess. How do you feel about your opportunity set at the moment? Is it getting bigger or is it sort of narrowing because of the, because the prices are running up or how, just what's your sense? Yeah, it's really mixed. I guess the, I guess longer term, like I'm just a big believer, like you can get too caught up in that stuff because, uh, you know, people think the market's expensive forever, but there's always going to be those few companies that do 10x revenue, like, um, like A2 Milk or whatever else that are still underappreciated. But it is, it is weird. I just went through a whole lot recently, all the ones that filed their 4C. So in Australia, that's um, if you're burning capital, you have to file every quarter, otherwise it's every you know, twice a year. Um, and some of those I would kind of, I try to like just quickly think what do I think this business would be worth looking at that before I'd look at what it's currently trading at. And I think, you know, business, you know, it's got a few million revenue growing a bit. Maybe it'll be, maybe it'll be 30 million or something in this market. And then some of them will be 200 or $300 million, <laughs> um, you know, burning cash, 
And uh, yeah, so I think there's definitely parts that are just crazy, but then it's just, there's other parts that are still underappreciated. And I don't think we've quite got like the full Robin Hood vibe here. You know, we don't have free trading here yet. So it's not fully crazy. <laughs> um, it's just, it's just, you just have to work a bit harder, I guess, and just really stick to that valuation. Cause it's easy to, it would be easy to own them, frankly, and um, have them go up a lot. And it, you'd look, you'd feel great for a while, but uh, eventually you're going to get punched in the face pretty brutally, I think for some of those and yeah, not, how, not our approach. How does stake judge stakes like the local Robin hood, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah, stake. I'm pretty sure they charge a bit for the transaction. They also they're only trading U.S. stocks, so they're not trading okay. Aussie stocks. Um, and I think they do something else with the spread. And um, you know, they all these different ways. <laughs> There's yeah, always yeah, ways that they ways they make money. Robin Hood, those jackals. They they're, they're not trading in the spread. They're just selling your data. So somebody <laughs> yeah, else is going to do it. Pretty much. I think they. I don't know what's going to happen with that business. They seem to have been found out a bit. The uh, the villagers have turned on them. <laughs> I've heard anecdotally from people who aren't stock market people who I know they're all trying to close their accounts and all of them are having trouble closing their accounts that's the other funny thing that I've been hearing I don't know I'd be a little bit nervous if I was Robin Hood and then they pulled down all the financing so I was like these that's that's not that's not good you don't like to hear that yeah yeah um i mean it's a crazy time right it's like uh, it's definitely a, a euphoric time like i don't think you can deny that by any means um and i guess for you know guys like myself it's just a matter of being even more picky and trying to figure out where you can still hold stuff and think that it's attractive um, valuation and, you know, where there's still opportunities, basically. Do you find it hard um, sort of marketing your strategy in Australia? Is it sort of a, is it a, is there a market for it? I was pretty fortunate to be honest. So um, I was running a portfolio service, the Motley Fool, which had you know a lot of clients in there, um, and we, that was like a very weird service because we did everything in full view of the clients. Like every trade, we told them what they were going to do. They would trade, and then we would trade ourselves in the model, um, and we did updates constantly. So it was like a weird mix where we we're constantly putting our thoughts out to them, and I think it built like a lot of trust. Um, so I was quite yeah. lucky when I left there. I was thinking I was just going to manage my own money, but I, you know. Um, very grateful. I had a lot of them write right in saying how, you know, the whole journey had improved their lives because we ran it for a few years, had some pretty good returns. Some of them gave to charity and yeah, it was pretty cool. Um, so had like a good community there and then they started reaching out to like different people to manage their money and it just kind of grew from there. So I was originally thinking I'll just do my own thing. And then I thought I'd have a couple of client accounts and ended up <laughs> being a journey to launch like a full, uh, fully fledged retail fund. Um, so yeah, I'm not fortunate position. I uh, had a lot of those clients, I think, um, and maybe they told other people join. So I haven't, I haven't, I try not to market basically. Um, and yeah, don't, I don't do anything trying to like put together a pitch deck for a Insta or whatever else. It, it's just not my game. I don't, don't know if I'd be good at that, you know, I'm taking an ownership position in the business and holding for long term, not kind of trading for quarterly volatility or whatever else. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's absolutely fascinating, Matt. Um, if folks want to follow along with what you're doing or get in contact with you, what's the best way to do that? Uh, yeah, I guess on Twitter, Matt Joss, M A T D J O A S S, and mattjoss.com, probably the two best. Um, also, mavenfunds.com.au. So, yeah, any of those ways, feel free to reach out. I'll tag those both in the notes. But, uh, Matt Joss, Maven Funds, thanks very much. Thanks, Toby. It's really great to chat. <laughs>